some people have an innate ability to be inspired by some people, some people, no matter how hard they are. Whenever truly be given. One of the things that's probably been the most um, uh, inspiring to me is to see that people of faith in the Bay Area are deeply committed to their faith because it's so countercultural. Welcome to the Vanderbloom and Leadership Podcast, where we talk about how to build, run, and keep a great team. I'm your host, Holly Tate. And on today's episode, William talks with Jenny Katrin, who's on the executive leadership team at Menlo Church in Menlo Park, California. Jenny has been named one of 30 leaders who are reshaping church leadership, according to Outreach Magazine. She also has a new book coming out, The Four Dimensions of Extraordinary Leadership. It comes out in just a couple weeks, so make sure you tweet your takeaways using the hashtag Vandercast. That's hashtag Vandercast for your chance to win a free copy of Jenny's book. Without further ado, let's jump in. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm thrilled to have you here at the podcast. Uh, Be sure and tweet to us as you listen. The hashtag is Vandercast because we don't want you to have to spell Vanderblumen. Uh, As you heard from Holly, we are blessed to have one of the best executive pastors in the country with us. It's Jenny Catron or Catron, and I think I might be saying that wrong. Is that is that wrong? <laughs> You're so close, William. It's Katrin. Yeah. Oh, Katrin. See, that's Just so think somebody. Cat. Yeah, yeah. Well, somebody told me it's the same as the tequila, and I didn't even know what they were talking about. It's like, <laughs> what are you? So we'll go with Cat. Jenny Catron. <laughs> Uh, Jenny, no, is, Jenny is on the executive team at Menlo Park Presbyterian Church, where John Ortberg is the pastor. And before that, she was at Cross Point as the executive director for Pete Wilson in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And this is really cool for me because it's like my world's colliding. In Nashville, we got to help uh, Cross Point find a staff person. And Menlo Park is part of the denomination that I served for many years as a pastor. So it's kind of like my old world Jenny's learning that in the new world, uh-huh. and it's it's kind of different, huh, Jenny? Oh, it is. It's it It's been a fun journey, um, and thanks, William, for having me on the podcast today. It's been a fun journey of just learning um, different church, you know, and different denominations, different cultures, different parts of the country, and it's fascinating to see how God works in so many different types of settings, and it's been a great opportunity and great learning uh, learning for me to be a part of both churches, yeah. both and, churches, great leaders. So, yeah. And you guys have been out there for, for how long now? About 18 months. So still feels new in some ways. And then in other ways, it feels like, okay, we're starting to, you know, feel a little, little settled, a little like we found our, found our niche. So, yeah. That's awesome. And, and if I'm not mistaken, the, the Bay area, the San Francisco Bay area is not a part of the Bible belt, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Um, that's been a fun, um, fun transition for me, you know, because I, I actually grew up in northern Wisconsin, which is not the Bible Belt either. Uh, but then, you know, I spent almost 20 years in the Tennessee area. And so to have done and that's where I, you know, did most of my ministry previous to coming to um uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. So it's quite fascinating to see the differences. You know, there are cultural things that, you know, large city to large city these days, you know, don't feel drastic. But when it comes to faith and when it comes to um, church, just quite startling to see the differences from the Bible Belt to the Bay Area. I think the statistics are like 2 to 4% of the San Francisco Bay Area are churched. And I don't even know what the statistic is in Nashville, but it's probably like 90% churched or something. I think it's 120. You know, 120, exactly. So, um, you know, so it's just a, it, it really creates different um, dynamics as a church leader and thinking of, you know, we have people who don't even know what church is. They have never heard of Jesus. They have never darkened the doors of a church. And, you know, in the, Bay, in the, in the Bible Belt, that's not quite the norm. People are at least familiar with church. They've probably had some, um, uh, you know, some connection to church through the years. But here you'll have multiple generations who are disconnected from the church. And so uh, the message of the gospel, the idea of a church and what it is and why you would even go there are are just new ideas. And so one of the things that's probably been the most um, uh, inspiring to me is to see that people of faith in the Bay Area are deeply committed to their faith because it's so countercultural. So, you know, they, it, it's not just like a cultural thing to do 
uh, like in the, in the South, it's like, ah, what church do you go to? It's kind of, you know, the scene, which club are you a part of? <laughs> and here in the Bay Area, if you go to church, that's a very big statement because being a, a Christian, being a person of faith is not, um, is not going to be popular. So it's, it's really fascinating to me to, for me to see the depth of commitment people have when they come to faith here in the Bay. That's cool. You know, we do uh, obviously a fair amount of work in Texas because there are some churches in Texas, but right <laughs> after Texas is California for where we spend our time. In fact, the only That's amazing. Yeah, the only employee we have you you've been to our office, you know, we've yep. got everybody centralized in Houston, but we did finally say, "Okay, we're in California enough that we're going to have a person out there because it's just wow. it, it's it's so busy and it is so different. Even like Northern California, the Bay Area, the Central Valley, Orange County, Southern California, which is yeah. not Orange County. It's there's right. just so many different pieces and parts. And uh, yeah. I think, you know, what what was a kind of a cultural shock for you and just in your personal life as, as you moved mm-hmm. to California? You know, I think some of it for me was how densely populated the area is, you know, mm. It is, and that's kind of particular to the Bay Area. There are other parts of California that are that way too. Um, but it, it, I mean, it is just so densely populated. It's fascinating. But then that population is so diverse. Um, you know, we'll walk down, you know, just this, you know, one of the downtown streets, and the number of languages you hear, you know, walking, just you know, passing people on the sidewalk is fascinating. And so, just the 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 number of cultures represented, the people that are moving into the area, um, you know, from other countries is it's just it's just fascinating. It's a great cultural immersion into um, just learning what you know people around the world literally you know are like. And, and there's so much of that that's fascinating to see them coming to the states um, for opportunities for education. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been a great education. I guess a coastal city that's probably typical too, which, you know, we didn't have as much of that in Nashville. But um, I think those two things, I think the, the population density and then the diversity have been really fascinating and inspiring. Well, I'll tell you one adjustment I had to make when I started doing work out there and getting to know folks is, you know, I'm from the South. I'm from North Carolina, which is pretty much Tennessee. And right. you, you have to... It, even more when I was in Montgomery, Alabama, pastoring, you have to have 20 minutes of relational conversation before you can have one transaction happen. Is that, totally. Does that make, yeah. I mean, you got to talk about your neighbor's cousin's friend's dog that's under the porch <laughs> for a long time before you can ever get to, and can we have a meeting? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. California's not that way. Yeah. So, Yep, that's actually been uh, somewhat refreshing because, again, I grew up in the Midwest. And so when I went to the South and had to learn, you know, the the slowing down and, you know, have relational conversations before you run into, you know, uh, just the task ahead of you. Um, but, yeah, coming back to California, I mean, the pace is just remarkable. You know, people's lives are – and it's uh, that's actually, you know, from a ministry perspective – it's actually really challenging to look at the pace of people's lives. The suicide rate in some of the cities around us is really high and just kind of it just very grieving to see the mm. intensity and the pace here, too. So um, but, yeah, people are in a hurry for everything. So it's yeah, it's a it's fascinating. Well, and if you're out there as a listener and you're looking at hiring someone from either of those cultures, you would do well to notice that because yeah. you might hire somebody from California or northern Wisconsin and, and feel like, Man, they're just not connecting with our people. Well, they might be, but they're connecting in the way that they know how to connect. And then, yep. you know, if you're if you're go- moving to the south and you don't own a dog, you probably ought to buy one or two. And if you uh, <laughs> and, and 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 you you need to learn, you know, relationship before task. There's so much uh, nuance in geography. Thank thanks for sharing yeah. that with us. Yeah, William, and I would echo, you know, just what you said because I think that's been a big piece for me as a. You know, I do a lot of the, the HR function falls under my responsibilities. And so the accl- acclimating staff that are moving cross country, you know, because I've personally done it on this this um, this time, it's much more like I'm much more sensitive to the issues that come with that. But then knowing from region to region, culture to culture, what are going to be the obstacles for people to really immerse themselves, uh, I think is something to really pay attention. And I know a number of your clients um 
that you just be just be wise to be aware of to know that getting people there is one thing, but getting them to immerse and really become a part of the culture is a big, big part of what we need to lead them through. So sorry. Sure. I no, that's great. On that one. No, that's great. And and it's a nice segue to another uh, topic I'd like to discuss with you. You talk about the HR function comes up under you. Uh, listeners may not know this, but part of the reason that probably happens is because you've done a phenomenal job over the year, over the years of identifying and developing internal leaders. Mm. Uh, and, and I, you know, it sounds like I'm talking myself out of a job. People hire us to find their pastor, but I'm a big believer in looking within your house. Uh, Now, I do tell people I am from Western North Carolina, so I have seen what happens when you constantly inbreed. You do have to go outside the family or you end up with too many toes. But but if you can look inside and find somebody, it's awesome. So, Jenny, tell us some keys. We've got a lot of church planters listening that can't afford to go hire staff. They need to develop somebody from within. What are some of the lessons you've learned over the years? Yeah, and I, I, I absolutely love this topic, William. You know, I have such a heart for developing people and seeing young leaders like trained and developed up. And I just, um, I believe so firmly that uh, that our first responsibility is to develop the people around us. And uh, and so it's, I think it's a really critical. I mean, you have the blessing and the curse when somebody is close to you and part of your team, you know, they're good, bad, and ugly. And oftentimes we can be, we can hurry to think we need somebody outside the organization when in fact we might need to, and really be actually called to develop up the people around us. And so, um, you know, I think a big piece for me is just And always looking through the lens of what's good about that person. What are, where do I see moments of their strengths in action? When do I see them shining? When do I see the light in their eyes that just says they, they love what they're doing? It's probably one of my greatest joys as a leader is I love particularly Sundays because, you know, on Sundays, the whole team's in action. Like you're seeing them in action, doing ministry, working with volunteers, working with the congregation. And I love on Sundays to just be kind of a quiet observer and watch my staff and see what they're doing and how they're doing it and what brings them life and what actually drains them. And so I think as leaders, it's a huge part of our responsibility to really pay attention to our team and really notice um, how they're doing and and what they're doing and how they're doing it. And um, so I'm always on the lookout. Like I'm always on the lookout for that little spark of joy, energy, passion um, within my team and then figuring out how do I keep aligning them towards that? How do I keep developing that? So, you know, I think I'm just wired naturally to be a coach. Like I just love seeing what my staff are doing and I love seeing their interests and then trying to just put fuel on that, you know? So if I can fuel something that they're passionate about, or I can fuel an area where they're, uh, just thriving and, and just, you know, because there's so much encouragement that comes from that. I think part of my passion for it is, you know, in my early days, I worked in the music business in Nashville but I had some remarkable leaders who kind of threw me in the deep end and gave me great opportunities to lead well before I was really deserving of those opportunities, well before I had fully proved myself. But I think they saw something that said, you know what, I think she's got it in her. And if we believe in her, you know, I often say the gift of belief is the best gift you can, gift you can give your team. The That's fact- good that you believe in them, that you see something in them. I mean, people rise to the occasion, you know, nine times out of 10, people are going to rise to the occasion if they know you believe in them. And yes. so I think as church leaders, I mean, this was the early days of Cross Point. For those of you that don't know um, Cross Point story, it was a church plant. My husband and I were part of the original like 30 um, members of the church. And I came on staff a couple years into uh, Cross Point's life. And, you know, we were a young church plant with very limited resources. And I, you just had to kind of figure out how to get the job done with the people you had. And um, I think sometimes that's a good place to be, you know, and then there, I, then I think there are critical points. And, you know, William, I recommend you guys all the time. We used you at Cross Point to say, there are times when we really do need a role that's outside. And then I really believe um, working with an expert is really important, you know, because huh. if it's beyond kind of the team around you, then, you know, I, I think bringing in somebody alongside you to help you find that fit is really critical. So uh, to, to your point, I think um, developing the people around you, I think, is our first priority. Um, and then there will be occasions and critical hires that, you know, you might need to look outside that I think, you know, it's, it's a mix of both. 
um, in my opinion. I remember the first hire that I had to make here, uh, Ben, who's now our COO. He, yeah. He's been with me from the beginning. Uh, the first week he was there, he, he, had, he had been an event planner, and so he knew how to multitask, and he complimented me well, and we thought, well, this would be great. Uh, he does need to learn the church. So I said, hey, here's a podcast by Andy Stanley. I want you to listen to it and uh, write a blog post about it and post it on our site. Well, he knew how to, didn't know how to do any of that. I mean, he didn't know how to log onto the blog. He didn't know what a podcast was. He didn't know who Andy Stanley was. You know, <laughs> <laughs> And he said, well, how am I going to do that? And I said, oh, you'll figure it out. And the, the podcast was actually Andy talking to leaders about look at your people and say you will figure it out and they'll figure it out people will yes. if you believe in them totally. and give them the gifts that they need the tools they need to accomplish it. it's great and the, and the flip side i'm afraid is also true in my experience tell me if you, what your take on this is yeah. i believe people will jump about as low as you set the bar totally yep. you set it low they'll jump just that low Yep, exactly. I think, and it, you learn a lot about your team, you know, when you, you set the bar kind of high and you say, figure it out. And I can't tell you how many times that happened, particularly at cross point where, you know, cause we were all in over our head, you know, um, cause we're all young leaders and, you know, Pete would look at me and just say, I don't know, figure it out. And <laughs> you go figure it out. You find yeah. resources, you find people. And the number of times we did that with our staff, but I think again, yeah, that, that sense of belief and, you know, and, and I've, you know, see, yeah, seen the other side where if you, um, try to protect somebody or you're not quite so certain and you set that bar kind of low, well, you know, that's what you're going to get. And you really kind of are able to filter out the staff when you're able to. Now that doesn't come without our responsibility to provide them the tools, like you said, or to help make sure if there's things, obstacles that I can clear or opportunity, you know, ways that I need to help support them, you know, that I'm mindful of that. But, um, you know, I think nine times out of 10, your staff are going to find a way to get it done if they know you believe in them. That's so true. So true. So, uh, Listeners, y'all might not know that we have a, a coaching network that we do. We actually have two. We have one that's a virtual thing that it's sort of lower cost and you can do from home. But then we have a very close, uh, closed group. It's, it's, I mean, you can sign up when you want, but it's, we shut the enrollment down pretty tight for on-site coaching. Jenny actually was able to come join us and be one of the coaches for our network this last time. She's a guest. And I got to hear her teach about extraordinary leadership, uh, kind of a fourfold approach to uh, leadership. And I thought, that is really good. More people need to hear about it. Well, duh, William, it, it's a book she's writing. <laughs> <laughs> and some other people think it's good, too. But the book is coming out, or I think in December. Is that right, Jenny? Yeah, that's right. Yep. It's called uh, The Four Dimensions of Extraordinary Leadership, uh, The Power of Leading from Your Heart, Soul, Mind, and Strength. And, um, and uh, you know, it was fun to be a part of the coaching group with you guys. You were one of my first guinea pigs for me to teach out that concept a little bit. But, you know, here's what's, here's what's so funny about this concept is it's right there rooted in the, the Great Commission uh, or the, the Great Commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, you know, I'm such a geek for leadership that I have for years been looking for this like perfect example or this, you know, great, um, uh, lesson that would just help unpack what does extraordinary leadership look like? And, you know, as I studied and just sought God so much on like, what does it mean to be a great leader? Because the definition of leader sometimes is so, um, so varied, you know, I feel like you almost need to reinvent the word or something. But uh, right there in, in that passage, you know, if, if loving the Lord with our heart, mind, soul, and strength is, you know, the implication is that's all of who we are. So what does it look like to bring that to the leadership table? What does it look like for me as a leader to lead with heart, to lead with soul, to lead with mind, to lead with strength? And all of those things coming together, I think, create uh, moments of extraordinary leadership. And that's the premise of the book. And really my heart is to say, you know, every one of us has a strength in one of those four more so than the others. You know, um, for me, I'm a real tactical leader. So the mind part of leadership comes really naturally, but I have to slow down and be present, um, for the relationships, that heart side of leadership. And so I think all of us as leaders need to be aware of where are we strong and where are we weak. And, you know, I think it's right there in the heart of scripture 
for the things, the elements that make for great leadership. And so that's what the, the book is about. Super passionate about the subject and feel like it's just key for every leader to, to kind of make that connection and put that in practice. Okay. So December 1st, the book is coming out and uh, everybody be on the lookout for that. Uh, mm-hmm. If you, if you had to tell me one other fascinating uh aspect of interviewing you is it's somebody who it really is a collision of two worlds. Menlo Park, fantastic church. I mean, yeah. my goodness, they've had a witness there for so long and done such good things. Cross Point, equally fabulous church, just doing things in very different ways. So you've had the chance to sit at the lead table of a church that is brand new out of the box, was in a school cafeteria for a mm-hmm. while and building stuff. And Menlo Park, which has been around for a long time, is a uh, more established and yeah. maybe has a little different pace of things than the brand new church plant. What's it like to transition from one to the other? And do you have any words of wisdom from for, for people out there who are moving either way from established to new or new to established? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this has been such a great season of learning for me as a leader. And I think it's, I think it's really important for us to be mindful of the way God is working in his church, whether, you know, young, new church or, you know, Menlo is 142 years old. And um, there's something really rich about the heritage, the legacy, the stories of leaders who have gone before. You know, one of my favorite stories from Menlo is, I think this was in the early 1900s. There were a group of eight people and the denomination was telling them they needed to close the church because they had dwindled down to eight people. And one of those people said, no, we have to keep going. And, you know, so that little, that little group mustered up the dollars to kind of keep the doors open. And I don't know if the lights were on, they probably didn't have electricity back then, but (laughs) (laughs) um, the the analogy start to to, start to not make sense. Um, But they, you know, they stayed after it. And, you know, here, however, many decades later, you know, you've got over 500 or 5,000 people worshiping every weekend at Menlo Park Prez in the center of Silicon Valley and, you know, in a very unchurched area. And so the sacrifices of the people that have gone before are really inspiring. And I think that makes me even cherish my, my memories of Crosspoint even more because I remember the 30 people who sat around a back patio deciding to launch Crosspoint and all of us committing to um, tithe faithfully, you know, so that we could see this church. <laughs> happen. And tithing faithfully when you're a 25 year old doesn't really amount to much, but it matters, <laughs> right. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I'm just, I think I'm really moved by the importance of whatever, wherever we are right now, wherever God has placed us, that there's such significance in that for future generations. So I feel like I'm seeing it on both sides of the life cycle. Um, But then really practically, I mean, that experience in being at a young church plant and then a really established church has taught me so much about the importance of the decisions that we make um, at every point of church's history and journey. So there's the kind of research on um, managing life cycles of organizations, and I've been just like rigorously studying, understand what does it mean to lead in a church that is at a different stage in the life cycle in the history. So I would say that for somebody going in direction is that really to understand and be aware of those differences in age and stage in church um, will, will cause you to lead differently. Like you will need to approach leadership differently. You'll need to understand culture. And so I think it's important to know that there are nuances and, you, and you, you, what worked in one place won't necessarily work in the other. Some things will, some things are transferable, especially with schools that tactically know about leading in those environments. And I would just say on both sides, whichever direction, you know, you might be moving, the um, importance of listening well and learning who are the, who are the, whether it's a church of two or 240, like who are the keepers of his really learning and listening to them about what really is the heart of that church, that ministry. Um, so there's just a lot of listening on, you know, again, when you're making a move, when you're making a transition, listening well to the people who've gone before you and, uh, and then, you know, kind of taking that and just praying for discernment and wisdom and how to help lead in the future. Uh, I would say it's probably the same. You'll take away with me. 
That's awesome. So a uh, couple of questions we ask all of our guests to kind of round out our time together. Uh, one is, what are you reading right now that's exciting? And that doesn't have to be, uh, please don't say good to great. Uh, you know, <laughs> just I, I love good to great, but tell me something I, I, I need to go read. Yeah, so uh, you know, I referenced this a little bit, but there's a book called Managing Corporate Life Cycles by Itzhak Adizis. And this guy has studied organizations for decades and really kind of defined, you know, kind of key points in the, the, the life cycle of an organization and what's going on. And um, it's a little bit of a academic read, but it is, it is just so incredibly enlightening, I think, for us as leaders to understand just the, the nuances of what is going on at different ages and stages of organizations is fascinating, fascinating stuff. So I've kind of been geeking out over that one lately. That's awesome. Uh, so real quickly, uh, Niners or Titans? Oh, man. Packers. <laughs> Do you have one of those cheese wedge hats things? You know, those, <laughs> I mean, I know normal people actually do that up there. It's, you can say, you can tell us if you've got well, one of those. No, I mean, there are a lot of people who wear those. I don't know that I would still classify them as normal, but um, uh, I, I do not have a cheese wedge hat, and nor am I a huge football fan. But because the Wisconsin is like my roots, that's, if I have to do football anywhere, that's where I. That's funny. And and finally, uh, my favorite question to ask people, you know, our listeners are pastors and pastors are human and they get depressed when they messed up. So I'm trying to encourage our listeners by having every one of our guests tell us an embarrassing moment they had while leading a service. I know. And you kind of proved to me that you asked this question. And I like I put a mental block because I so, you know, like am so mortified when I, you know, mess stuff up. But uh, I feel like it, there's just so many like little things of like, you know, jumping up at, you know, when, a you know, before the last chorus of the song is done and the worship leader, like giving you the eye and telling you, no, not yet. Like you're not <laughs> supposed to be up here yet. Um, I've had a number of those moments where, you know, all of a sudden you're standing there on the stage while they're singing the last chorus of the song. And um, so that happens a lot. Um, that, and then I'm guilty of the, you know, the, where, where you twist your words or a, a word comes out wrong and um, it might be mildly scandalous and you just kind of push on by and even try not to, you know, make it obvious that, you know, you just <laughs> said something you didn't mean to say. So I've had a number of those moments too, but yeah, it's like, That's... it's, yeah, it's always, it's always a little nerve and I'm not on the stage every weekend, you know, so I will do, I, I admire pastors who are preaching every week. Because you just are putting yourself out there every week, but I services and out and then I speak at conferences and so forth. So, um, I speak at church occasionally, but I'm not on the stage nearly as much as some of the pastors are. And so uh, wow. I have I have great admiration for all of you who are on the stage weekly. That's awesome. Well, Jenny, thanks so much for joining us, and thanks, guys, for tuning in this week. Uh, if you'll listen, Holly's got some announcements about what's coming up in the future. We've got a great lineup of people joining us for the podcast and hope to hear from you about it. If you've got suggestions or comments, feel free to tweet them out and hashtag Vandercast. We'll talk to you again next week. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. Visit Vandercast.com to pre-order your copy of Jenny's new book, The Four Dimensions of Extraordinary Leadership. See you next time.